Back in the dark days of the pandemic, one of the true movie-going tragedies was that not nearly enough people saw Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 1 on the big screen. But y'all don't say that. Shut up. With many of the set pieces being shot for IMAX, it was an altogether different experience in cinemas than it was on streaming. And had it come out at a different time, I bet it would have made at least double the impressive $108 million that it made domestically. My Iraqis. Why do? With the sequel now hitting theaters, this will likely be the first time a huge chunk of the audience is seeing Villeneuve's adaptation of the Frank Herbert classic the way it was meant to be seen, with the desert vistas of Arrakis all the more stunning on a giant IMAX screen. As such, I'm expecting a massive box office jump for this, especially with the two young stars, Timothée Chalamet and Zendaya, being significantly bigger now than they were in 2021. Quality-wise, Dune Part 2 is a stunning achievement. A much more action-driven story than the exposition-heavy first film, it wastes no time in plunging us directly into the war between the Fremen and the Harkonnens, picking up in the immediate aftermath of Paul's knife fight with the Fremen warrior Jamis. Many are comparing it to The Empire Strikes Back, and that's pretty fair. It's not true. That's impossible. As it picks up in the middle of a chaotic war, and has a conclusion that leaves us anticipating a third film, which is to be based on Dune Messiah. Indeed, I can only think of a handful of times in recent years when I've been so immersed in a film. In fact, I don't even think it really happened to me last year outside of maybe Oppenheimer, and the scale and verisimilitude of Villeneuve's work is just staggering. By design, it really does feel like half of a bigger hole with the first film, but even still, I think those who might have found the first movie a little too talky might find this the kind of quality jump that the Dark Knight made from Batman Begins. As it really grabs you right off the bat, doesn't let go until the end credits. Villeneuve has shot the entire film with IMAX cameras, giving it a staggering visual look that really needs to be seen on the biggest screen possible. This might actually be the best looking film Greg Frazier has ever shot, which is saying something considering his filmography. Even still, I do find sometimes he shoots a little bit dark, but Dune 2 and the first one as well don't suffer from that. Everything is really beautiful to look at. The cast is uniformly excellent, from the returnees to the new additions. Timothée Chalamet was always ideally cast as Paul Atreides, and Dune 2, he makes a convincing transition, as he really has to go from being the boy duke of the first film to a leader that's crushed under the weight of destiny. The theme of this movie makes it much different than David Lynch's adaptation of the same material, as that was a kind of heroic take on the messianic themes of the novel. By contrast, Villeneuve's movie shows us the devastating cost of Paul, with him more a reluctant leader than we've seen before. He is expertly supported with Rebecca Ferguson's Lady Jessica, much more of a schemer this time, with an unhinged lust for power that was only hinted at in the first film and it doesn't make her all that different from the Harkonnens in the end, putting her at odds with her heroic son. And worse, it might make him a different man than he was. Zendaya's Chani grounds him with her evoking both her character's deep, almost star-crossed love for Paul, as well as her bittersweet knowledge of the fact that Paul's destiny may take him far away from her, or make him a different man than the one that she fell in love with. Physically, her and Chalamet look amazing together, Villeneuve actually uses Zendaya and Chalamet in a kind of interesting way in the fight sequences because he has Chani and Paul fighting like they're two halves of a bigger hole. It's kind of amazing and it really kind of drives home the connection the two characters have. I've never really seen that in another movie. Meanwhile, Javier Bardem and Josh Brolin are touching as Paul's two pseudo-father figures. Bardem is Stilgar, the Fremen leader convinced that Paul is the messiah they've been waiting for, and he kind of gives the film a little bit of levity at times, although his role is also quite serious when it needs to be. Brolin's gurney, of course, is Paul's last connection to the House of Atreides, and Brolin comes in kind of late into the film, but when he shows up, boy, you're very happy to see him. Both men give the impression of being willing to sacrifice everything, including their lives, for Paul, making their performances sneakily affecting in a lot of ways. But as far as the baddies go, Dave Bautista and Stella Skarsgård are back with bigger roles this time, but in terms of menace, they cannot help but be eaten alive by the saga's newest addition, Oh yes, Austin Butler's Fade Rotha may be the role that finally gets people to stop looking at him like he's Elvis, with him playing a sadistic baddie that's about as far removed from the king as you can get. His intensity and sadism really pushed the boundaries of the BG-13 rating, and the final confrontation with Paul likely is going to rank pretty highly among the best action scenes of the year. 
Meanwhile, other new additions to the cast, including Christopher Walken and Florence Pugh, have comparably less screen time as the Emperor and his daughter. Still, both convey the scheming, calculating natures of their character with aplomb. For real, folks, the casting is great, and Walken is kind of subtle this time. He's not really doing Christopher Walken the whole movie. No, he's playing it the way that a character actor would. And I think that Christopher Walken, because he's so iconic, sometimes, you know, people mistake him for being a ham, but when he wants to be subtle and effective, he's really good, and he's awesome in this movie. Plus, there's the score by Hans Zimmer, which remains the perfect soundtrack for this space saga. Should we get a third installment of this as expected, this may really well end up being one of the great sci-fi trilogies of all time. Really definitely the sci-fi trilogy of our generation at least, with it being up there with the original Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. In this day of assembly line blockbusters, it's really a miracle that director Denis Villeneuve has managed to get not one but two incredible, uncompromised epics like this through the studio system. Yes, it works as a tentpole blockbuster, but Dune Part 2 is also filmmaking at its highest level and should be remembered when it comes to award season next year because this is a best picture candidate if ever I saw one. It's a real cinematic event. Everyone owes it to themselves to take in on the biggest screen that they can, and I give it, happily, an excellent 10 on 10 because, folks, I was riveted. This prophecy is how they enslave us!